So, bro, do you even science? Bros do science. Hello, we're here in Performance Rx. We're uh, glad to meet uh, Dr. Stuart McGill. We're gonna learn everything about lower back pain, about CrossFit and some exercises. Is lower back generalized? And basically how we can become a back mechanic. So stay tuned and let's go find out. Thank you, Dr. Magu, for the honor of being here. We're at Performance Rx. Uh, thank you very much for holding this interview. It's a great pleasure to meet you. <laughs> There's a little Canadian yeah. for you, Rocco. Okay. <laughs> Making most of out of it. Uh, yeah. Great, great honor to see you, sir. And looking forward for your seminar, too, about from your assessment and how we can uh, know from how we go from pain to performance and being a back mechanic, as your book says. The secret to a healthy spine, your doctor isn't telling you. And we're gonna go into depth of this book. So, who is Stuart McGill? Well, I'm a pr professor at the University of Waterloo. I've been a professor for 32 years. And our objective has been to uh, investigate how the spine works and mechanisms of injury and the pathway through to pain and then uh, how to reduce that pain sensitivity mm -hmm. and then, only then, uh, choose the wisest approach to create a pain-free foundation for movement. Um, as you know, I do see uh, patients. Uh, I don't ask to see them. They're all referred by their various clinicians. And some of them are very disabled backs. And others are uh, right at the top of the human spectrum of athleticism. Uh, and uh, my job is to, for the disabled ones, get them back to be out of pain and just enjoy daily life. And then for the uh, athletes, uh, restore their athleticism. So it's not only a matter of getting rid of their pain, it's a matter of creating that athletic foundation for whatever their body is, for whatever their injury history, and for whatever is required of that particular uh, athletic demand. So it requires a knowledge of their, their particular sport, and then build them to uh, uh, do that. If you take them back to just their old habits, chances are they will replicate what hurt them before. It's like an example you always make with the thumb. If you keep hitting your thumb with a hammer, um, you will, at some point when you just touch it, you can feel pain. Well, that's it. Uh, you will sensitize that particular tissue, so you lightly touch it and the person will recoil. I mean, there are uh, people in the uh, spine area that will say, if you touch a patient, and they flinch that this is a sign of a great psychosocial disorder. Well, no wonder that person isn't aware of what is causing uh, acute episodes of back pain. They're clueless, and they're very afraid to uh, reach forward and flush the toilet or brush their teeth because the last time they did that, they had an acute back attack. But if you could teach them that, and, and again, everyone has a different pain trigger. So an assessment is required, and, and it's, people say it's not easy to find back pain triggers. Well, I disagree. I think with the right uh, approaches, and uh, they're not easy approaches, but you can narrow down the source of that person's pain trigger and then coach them around it. So it might be a movement, a posture, or a load. And then you break down the load. It might be a duration, a frequency of load application. Uh, or a magnitude. But if you put all of those things together, you can probe an individual's back, define quite precisely their pain triggers, and if you are a good clinician, you will find a way for them to move and still perform the task, and now you've liberated them. Instead of giving the movement fear, you've done precisely the opposite. You've empowered them 
they're in control, I know what causes my back pain, now I can move in full confidence, and then they wind down their pain sensitivity, and they're off to the races again enjoying life. So that, that's really the synopsis of it. <laughs> well, well, it's down to the word you said, good clinician. We usually hear generalized lower back pain. Right. I've been coaching people and training for about 15, 16 years, and when I ever heard that, it didn't make sense to me. Like, what is generalized lower back pain? There's well, I don't think there's any such thing as generalized low back pain. Have you ever heard of a patient coming in and say, I got generalized head pain, I've got generalized leg pain. This wouldn't be tolerated. Exactly. No, it is you investigate the head exactly. and deal whether, is it a, a TMJ musculoskeletal disorder? Have they got CNS pressurization because they've been leaking through, uh, through a collision to their brain? Or what is it? And if you, don't match, if you don't match the treatment to the precise cause, you have zero effect. Well, back pain is not a homogeneous condition. There's all sorts of subcategories of unstable backs, too stiff backs, torn ligaments, uh, and then people will say, well, we didn't see anything on the scans. Well, I'm the guy who created a lot of those injuries, and uh, they were only on cadavers, but we at least got an idea of the mechanism of a tissue damage. And then we, we would x-ray it, MRI it, and CT scan it, and then we would microdissect it. MRI doesn't show very much. No. We find massive damage on microdissection. So where did this idea come from that an MRI is a uh, precise measure of tissue damage? It doesn't exist. So those who say, well, your MRI doesn't show anything, we know of no reason for your pain, therefore it must be in your head. Oh, my this is a tragedy. It comes from clinical incompetence. Which creates more problems if you're saying to a patient that it's in your head. Well, I've had patients who are suicidal exactly. because some clinician, shame on them, has told that individual, I can't find your pain, it must be in your head. And the only problem was that clinician was unskilled in finding that person's pain. Now that person is an adult. They're a solid citizen. And when they hear, I know I have pain, but if it's in my head, I'm crazy. And that's what drives them suicidal. Plus the pain, which also makes you crazy when all day living becomes uh, rough. What is the definition of torture according to who? The WHO. It is you give a person low-grade chronic pain, deprive them of sleep, and now I've just described exactly. certain kinds of back pain that go uh, they're, they're just out of hand dismissed by some clinicians who don't have the skill to uh, investigate. investigate, yes. Great. Um, we hear about bracing lots of times yes. and drawing in either having our TBA sure. or bracing. Can we just talk about it? Yes, I'm, I've measured uh, that quite a bit. Let me exactly. give you an example. So there are many categories of back pain, but consider if you had torn knee ligaments, you would probably detect the laxity in the knee by doing a drawer test on the knee. So that sheer movement that's allowed in the joint because of the damage would create pain or you would measure laxity. Well, let's uh, consider the spine where you might damage a disc or you might damage a ligament. Mm -hmm. It creates laxity at the joint. Exactly. There's little micro movements occurring at the joint and when you mimic those micro movements, it causes the person's pain trigger and then you wind up pain sensitivity. So let me give you an example. I am going to create a little micro movement, but I am not going to use any muscle bracing at all. Just relax. I'm going to go up on my heels and land one and a half times body weight on my heels. Boom. Now, I might say, ah, I felt the back pain trigger, or I felt my right toe with a radiating pattern go a little bit numb. So that would be the fifth lumbar root on the right hand side, as you know. Now, I'm going to say, you're the clinician, put your fingers there and there, either side of my navel, go ahead, and now, don't draw in, but push out. Now, I've pushed out. Now I'm going to tune it. I don't tune it up so I'm crushing myself, but I find the level, just sufficient bracing that 
context. You've just engineered out the micro movement, now you haven't triggered the uh, pain response. So do you see how the brace is it's tuned to create what's called sufficient stiffness, just enough sufficient. to take the pain out. It's sufficient stiffness. Too much would be stupid. Now, if you're going to lift uh, 100 kilos off the floor, you need a different requirement of stiffness. Otherwise, that stack of... for 100 kilos. Exactly. So it's all a matter of tuning. Now, when you draw the muscles in, you bring the muscles and the guy wire systems closer to the supporting mast. And every engineer will tell you that now buckles at a lower load. Now we have... Uh, so, so this whole idea that drawing in the transverse abdominis stabilized the spine was, uh, it never survived any test of those who actually measured spine stability. They couldn't understand it. But it was promoted, uh, but there was no evidence by the people promoting it that it uh, uh, enhanced spine stability. In fact, it decreases spine stability. Now we have people who say, ah, well, let's activate the pelvic floor, because the pelvic floor then is the pathway to activating the stabilizers. But this uh, isn't true either. You can activate your pelvic floor very independent of your stabilizing muscles. Now, can you imagine a, uh, uh, a very skilled squatter drawing up their pelvic floor before they squatted? Because if you measured that, it would be so inhibiting of performance, yeah, and actually you build pressure. Not picture it either. Right. So, Somehow these things get propagated uh, and uh, people develop opinions who've never measured these uh, uh, links and pathways That's from the mechanism through to a tissue stress, which then causes pain. That's exactly why I wanted to talk to the source, because there's a sea of misinterpretations out there and people are confused what to do and what you said about tuning because it's different when you have just your weight, body weight. It's different when you've got 100, as you said. Well, let me follow that example up, if I may. So I tuned up the right amount of bracing and stiffness to engineer the micro movement out so that didn't cause pain. But let's do the opposite now. Let me work with a patient, and they will say, oh, I'm bracing. Oh, that made my pain even worse. Bracing comes at a cost. It comes at a compressive cost to the spine. So if that person had a pain sensitivity, either through t true damage or neurological windup, either one of the two, you're now overdriving the compressive tolerance of the spine. What the problem is. And now I make the pain even worse. But the clinician shouldn't say, oh, bracing is bad. They just missed the tuning. They didn't have the clinical skill to find the magic combination of mechanics that would take their pain away. So then they say, oh, the pain's in your head, just yeah, keep just, moving. Yeah. And this is just leaving one tragedy after another in people needlessly uh, suffering with their back pain. So it's not intrinsic muscle contraction. Well, again, this idea came from people who never measured spine stability. Spine stability has three different forms, if you want me to tell you what Yes, what, when you're measuring stability and what it actually does. So, number one, you need proximal stiffness to create distal mobility. So if I have a pec major muscle, it connects my rib cage, spans the shoulder joint, and connects into my humerus. Distally, it causes arm flexion. Proximally, it bends my rib cage towards... So if I was to push you with that single muscle, that wasn't very effective, but if I create proximal stability... Oh, yeah. Now... Okay, so now take the little child at the hospital who has neurological inhibition or para paralysis of quadratus lumborum. Mm -hmm. They will walk, they can do leg swing on one side, and the other side, they collapse. So they can't even walk without core stability mm -hmm. of quadratus lumborum. I never mentioned transverse abdominus or any nope. of these other things because they don't have nearly the stabilizing effect that allows function. So even to walk, I must have obliques, quadratus, and the opposite glute. So there's a core pattern. Now how did all of this idea get going about transverse abdominus when the things you have to do, get on and off the toilet, tie your shoe, sneeze, have a baby, cough, <laughs> cough and walk, I've just shown you when you measure all of those different 
uh, vital uh, uh, abilities. And then to run and play sport and lift and load, and load uh, you will see the brain is an orchestral conductor, conducting an orchestra, and you've got to sing a different tune as you move and load and play and be flexible and dance and don't laugh at my dancing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've measured, we've measured. I'm not talking through my hat here. We've measured Middle Eastern belly dancers. Fantastic mobility. Mm. Wonderful. But they're weak, very weak. And you can't mix up a lot of mobility and then ask them to go and train with heavy load. That requires a stiffness and a t a, you, you must adapt quite a different spine. So you can't have it both ways here. Exactly. You, you're going to have to choose one. Thank you very but much. anyway, there, there's a little bit of a, a start on this, this whole uh, stability I, idea, but you've got to build also guy wire systems to support that vertebra stack. And if you don't stack it and you get a little unstable with some unbalanced Shear forces as Tor Torso muscles. Well, we're not at shear forces yet. That's a different type of trigger. That's I'm just talking about buckling. buckling. And uh, again, we were the first to observe buckling behavior in people with uh, unstable conditions. They didn't, they, they made a motor control error. But again, it wasn't due to a transverse or a multifidus. The orchestra was off. And had they trained to create a very robust uh, pattern that would allow them to go all the way through from dance to a reach to a lift in a safe way in a, in, in a, in a way that 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 ensured sufficient stability exactly. so once you've built sufficient stability then you have to build the requirements to move and throw and catch and punch and kick and it's orchestra as you said it's it not is. one muscle correct the body will works as a whole and yeah. sometimes we're like oh you're not uh, using your TVA now and it's like that's never ever been shown once you activate the abdominal wall to about one or two percent of maximum you cannot not activate exactly. your TVA it's not possible um, but you can't walk without a quadratus lumborum yeah. but you sure as hell can walk without a, a transverse abdominus exactly. now that's you might not so, right? yeah you might not sneeze quite uh, as well but internal oblique is a redundant muscle for transverse. Now, interestingly, in surgery, you will find some people whose transverse looks like food wrap. There's hardly anything there. It's a membrane. And yet in others, you'll find a bit more thickness and robustness to it. But internal oblique, you'll find, is a much thicker, more robust uh, uh, muscle for uh, most people. Thank you very much. It was, uh... <laughs> Amazing information because we are, uh, are lost, as we said before, and I'm going to say that a lot of times. We don't use context, and people are just pulling things out of their hats. Yes. And coaches follow different, let's say, Google searches. That <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, uh, my st I'm not a, a, a social media type. And uh, it's amazing when I go on, uh, someone shows me something on something like Facebook. And I think, how are all these experts on Facebook? If you're on Facebook, you're not in the lab. You're not in the lab so, so you can either do your work or you can do Facebook. Not with CrossFit, which is a really, I really like it and enjoy it as a training. But it's, everything's like a knife. It's how you use it. I can cut bread and cut my finger if I don't use it properly, but I can cut a slice of bread. It doesn't mean that the knife is bad. And people are starting to blame CrossFit or movements. And I will just say one exercise, which is, uh, let's say, the kettlebell swing, which is like basically a movement from the hip and thrust, the weight goes up. And I'm not talk about kyphosis or if we have a proper impeachment, just the movement. And Poliquin uses the, that's really bad for your back, lower back, because the weight is far away from your body. This this makes sense because you measured that. I'm one of the few guys in exactly. the world who's measured the mechanics of the kettlebell swing. Can we go through the movement? Absolutely we can, but can I just back up to make uh, something clear about CrossFit? Yes. All right. 
for those interested, I was asked to give a commentary on CrossFit. Uh, I think it was published first in T Nation. I was interviewed, yes. and then that propagated around. John Rush. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, here's what I said. I love CrossFit, and I hate CrossFit. And exactly. it's like I love bench press, and I hate bench press. It, it, it's exactly what you said with the knife. It's how it's used. I love CrossFit for uh, this reason. If you walk across any university campus now, it is pathetic, the condition of the general students. They are soft. They are looking forward to a little bit of misery in their lives exactly. because of their bodies not being resilient. And when they are stressed, they are going to pay the price. Yes. So I love the community that CrossFit builds around fitness. Fantastic. And when you go, we were in one yesterday. And I uh, love it. I love the atmosphere. I don't like some of the programming. I've documented uh, how the spine creates stress concentrations, which will eventually lead to injury. So when I see programming, for example, of someone might do 15 speed burpees on the ground, which you have to have a mobile spine to do. Yes. Fine. And then immediately go and snatch. do 10 repetitions of a snatch. These are people who may not even have the hips. Olympic lifting is a very special sport. And as you know, I've yes. worked with some top Olympic lifters. Not everybody can lift Olympic. You have to have a certain hip. You have to have a certain shoulder to carry. I don't have it. I will never be an Olympic lift lifter. Um, but if you, which doesn't make you less of an it, athlete. No, it's, or, it was just the wrong tool for me. Or if my hips are not right, my shoulders are not right. It doesn't mean that I'm not strong enough or mobile enough. It's my structure. Absolutely. You still might be wonderful at throwing a football or MMA short kick or whatever it happens to be. Boom. <laughs> but um, so if you're building a CrossFit athlete, you better train CrossFit. Are you going to train a great Olympic lifter? You will not because great Olympic lifters never pollute the lifting engram with the fatigued engram. Exactly. They train singles. Uh, and double lifts, creating that perfect movement pattern so when they walk up to the platform and they set the wedge, it is a perfect tape that they run every time. And if they were to train when they're tired, they would pollute that tape and lose that perfect pattern. And when you talk to the great ones, they will all tell you, I'm still searching for my perfect lift. Exactly. I haven't had it yet. Exactly. <laughs> so true. It is. So there's a, just a, a, a comment on how CrossFit fits into all of this. Um, but when we talk about the kettlebell swing, uh, I, I can tell you what goes on with it. Now, when you lift, your spine sees a certain ratio of compressive load and shear load. Yes. Your spine is built for that. Mm -hmm. The facet joints are like shingles on a roof. They support the shear, etc. So when you lift, your back, as I said, is designed for that compression and shear ratio. A kettlebell swing is different. When you do a kettlebell swing, you start with that normal compression to shear ratio. But as you come up, the compression decreases and the shear increases. So there's a little bit of shear working of your spine. Now, uh, when I wrote uh, our article documenting the uh, joint loading and the mechanics and the muscle activation patterns of the uh, kettlebell swing. Um, I quoted two top athletes, if you read the article, and one said, the kettlebell swing was the perfect exercise for my recovery after I herniated a disc and then he went and set the world raw right. powerlifting. And I still read that in your book. Too. Yes. It was a perfect tool for him. The next athlete, again, an extremely strong athlete, said that's the one exercise that tweaks my back just a little bit. And the reason is they have a little shear instability. So if we do a shear instability test on their back, we will locate the shear and we'll say, you know what? 
the kettlebell swing probably exactly. isn't your best yeah. choice of exercise, but this is the way with every exercise. Exactly. You determine what the pain trigger is, you avoid it, let it settle. You then, because you have a very good understanding of the science and the art of training, the two go together, uh, what you need as a tool to take that particular body to whatever the goal uh, happens to be. Now the kettlebell swing produces wonderful neurology. It produces a pulse. Boom! It's exactly timing and pulsing that your body needs. Just come here and stand in front of me. So you've heard of Bruce Lee's one inch punch. Yeah. So Bruce Lee's one inch punch is just relaxing and then when you read his description it was I relax my body until my fist meets the target, hits the target, at that time I focus all my energy into the fist. So, if you use muscle, you're, you're, you've got to use muscle to start the pulse, boom, and then you've got to boom, let it go, but when you hit the target, when you turn your body to stone, it's the difference of that versus that. Oh, yeah. Now, when you get that one inch punch right, it is just a, don't worry, I won't do it. Okay. But, <laughs> uh, I was no, 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 no. But I'm just going to punch you and there's nothing behind it. No. But now I'm going to stiffen my core. I'm going to create a power pulse in rotation through my hip. And I mean, it's pretty devastating. You know, you can just put someone through a wall. Yes. And the great ones do that. Now let's use the gift of the kettlebell swing to teach the neurology to relax. But as my good friend Pavel Sotsolin teaches, legend, legend that uh, Bruce Lee, unbeknownst to many in the 70s, would use a kettlebell and employ karate kime with the swing. So instead of hard style finish, which is fine, and I know why that's taught, but to create the kime and that pulse, that impact, boom, swing, and then as the kettle comes to top dead center, train the body to pulse. Boom. Relax. Boom. 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 You got it? Exactly. It's a wonderful training uh, of uh, neurology. So, exactly do you see once saying. again the kettlebell swing? I love it, I hate it like I do with everything. It's all a matter of matching that training tool to the, uh, to, to the goal that you're trying to achieve in the most effective, efficient, safest way possible. And that's exactly why uh, basically it's bad coaching, basically, or bad, if you're a bad clinician as we said with generalized pain. Yeah. Rather than being the swing, the kip, the uh, whole body position, any of them. If someone has a really strong opinion over a single exercise, there's usually something being sold. It's a red flag there. I, it, I'm afraid it yeah. is. Uh, it's, uh, uh, again, it's just being open enough and the great coaches, the great clinicians, know how to assess, they have a lot of tools in their toolbox, they know which one to pull out for that particular individual. So, you know, the kids as I call them who, who spend uh, too much time on Facebook and getting into these little wars about well, what's better and my guru is better than yeah, your guru. And I, I don't know how some people uh, have, have painted me into the corner of, oh, McGill only does this or that. Uh, all I've ever said is match the best tool to the injury history, to the training goal, and, and then investigate. I, I investigate it, and then execute with precision. I use uh, your exercises, bear dog, which is an amazing exercise, but some people would say I've got pain. So it's on the practitioner to change that. Absolutely. Because uh, Dean Somerset saying about side plank, about the hip, and that's my last question before we go to your book. Can we have, what's wrong with the pelvis if we have pregnancy so it's twisted or it's not there with our lower back? Well, uh, I don't know until I assess the, the, the patient. The so Absolutely. Exactly. But just to start off a brief discussion on that, you've got a spine, you've got the pelvic ring, and that pelvic ring has a little bit of flexure to it. Yes. The articulations are at the SI joints and the pubis, 
uh, symphysis uh, at the front. If you get someone who does too many uh, Bulgarian split squats, mm -hmm. or they might do uh, far too much loaded lunging, what will happen is as you split, one side of the pelvis mutates posteriorly, the other forward. And if they keep doing that with more and more load, they will start out strengthening adaptation, and creating adaptation. positive a adaptation. But eventually they tip the balance. So the cumulative stress is no longer building them, it's tearing them down and they loosen up one of the uh, joints and now it becomes painful. Then when they take a heavy load, the spine is bearing the compressive load, but the uh, sacrum is an arrowhead shaped. Now it's already been loosened a little bit. Now you drive force down to the arrowhead and it splits apart a little bit. So then I start asking them, start walking. And I squeeze them and they might say, ah, oh, you know, oh, that, that helps. Yes. Or I might squeeze them down here and they say, oh, that makes me sick. So I'm playing with the pressures and defining very precisely what the pain triggers are, what the loads are that's causing it. Is it a, a more of a shear load? Is it a mutation? Is it a, shear, a, a compression? All of these things, and I'm finding them, probing, understanding the mechanism. Then I will be able to tell them, what is the source of that pelvic ring pain? Here's what you must do to avoid it, allow it to desensitize. But to tighten a pelvic ring is not an overnight fix. It takes quite a while to let it settle, let it gristle and stiffen again and get that load-bearing resiliency back. But there you go. I, oh, yes, that's what I want to hear because there's not... I wish I could show you all kinds of tests, but you're going to learn them tomorrow. Oh, yes, looking forward to that. And what I want to go through is just my humble opinion. This is what, a book that literally made me close to back mechanic. You helped me a lot with my work. I have, I have all your books, but this is the best book I've ever read. Lots of myths that are in there and make me understand why they don't work in simple words that everybody can understand. Why um, I've got pain when I can deadlift, but then I have no pain, and then I'm going to grab a glass of water and I'm going to start feeling pain. And it doesn't make any sense. Makes perfect sense. But exactly, that's what I want to say. <laughs> Can you tell me, this is your child. Can you tell me what, what you're Well, uh, as you know, I've written books for clinicians, which were really what I considered a bit more definitive. Uh, for example, my third edition of Low Back Disorders, I put a lot of effort in teaching clinicians how to do a pain provocation assessment. But... Uh, members of the lay public would read it and say, boy, this is difficult stuff, but for the first time, I'm seeing why I'm having back pain. Would you write a book for us, for the lay public? So that's, that was the genesis of uh, Back Mechanic. Uh, but it took me five years, and my struggle was I need to give the reader enough information that it has integrity and truth, mm -hmm. but I have to make it simple enough for them to consume and then implement on their own. And that, that, that took me five years to seek that, that balance. That would make special, yeah. Uh, well, that was my intent. Uh, so that, that's the purpose of it. it. It shows the person who's been to the doc and the doc says, we can't find your pain or here's a pain pill, it's in your head. They've been dismissed. And uh, I guide them through a self-assessment. Is it the assessment that they would get from you? No, it isn't but it's one that they can do themselves, exactly. hone in the, on their pain triggers, so for the first time they're savvy, they understand why that causes them pain, and then what to do to reduce the offending trigger and allow that pain sensitivity just to settle down. If you give them exercise right away, they're already sensitized and painful. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? How many times does a patient come to you and say, can you give me an exercise for my back? Or you go to the hospital here and they hand you a sheet. Here, do these exercises. It's crazy. They've guaranteed failure. Never their government why. is wasting their money. Yeah. Instead of go through the self-assessment, understand your pain triggers, stop them now. If 
extension causes you pain, you can't do extension exercises. They will yoga make helps. you worse. Yeah, <laughs> yoga is going to hurt you. Um, maybe the pain is from neural tension. So stop pulling your knees to the chest in the morning as your clinician may have told you to do, who never laid a hand on you and measured it's that. It's going to be helpful for 10 minutes, but then the pain is going to be excruciating when it comes back. Well, this is the neurology of pain. When you stretch a muscle or a nerve, it kicks off a stretch reflex. It will last and give you analgesia or less pain for 20, 30 minutes. But you picked the scab underneath in doing so. So later, the pain does come back, and it never does go away. You can keep stretching and stretching and stretching. So there would be an example. And then, based on your pain triggers, choose specific exercises that will build the foundation. So if you're unstable and have micro movements, you better stabilize it. If uh, it's due to uh, another source of pain, I, it could be a motion, a posture, a load. We go through those categories, and then uh, we will uh, create a, uh, an adaptation in the spine to make it more resilient within the tolerance of your defined motions, postures, and loads, which we defined in the self-assessment. Oh, yeah. So that, that's the book. Okay. Where can we find more about you? Uh, well, I, it doesn't mean, I don't matter. Who, who cares about oh, me? I so do. just read Lots the book. Lots of people do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's www. Oh, the, back, the, the website. website. Yes, backfitpro.com, just like it sounds, okay. backfitpro.com. We can find all your books, we can find Back Mechanic, which is it, every practitioner's tool for the better back, for them and for their clients, patients out there, and for the average person that wants to know what's wrong with them and have a better understanding. And you've got seminars lined up. I do. Um, I'm, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, I have my teaching team with me. You've met uh, uh, Joel Proskovitz, for example, uh, Ed Cambridge, Mark Beavers. These people are strategically uh, around the world and assist in teaching these uh, courses to clinicians. And uh, it's so interesting when we teach a course, even members of the lay public uh, uh, will attend and they'll say, we didn't get it all. But for the first time, we weren't dismissed. For the first time, we were shown that back pain isn't normal. It has a cause. And uh, now, you know, defaulting again to it's in your head. There are a few that it is in their head. A few. Uh, there are a few. Yeah. And uh, uh, you need to recognize those patterns and look after them appro appropriately. But they're rare. Yeah. They're almost always, it's in their head because the pain comes first, and then it drives them yeah. uh, mentally to a state where it may be exaggerated. I don't blame them, but take their pain away, and this resolves. Thank you very much for your time. It was a great honor. Me too. Thank you very much. Me too. I'll do, ah, can I do it? <laughs>